Uh, thank you. I am um, humbled to be here today. Uh, before I begin, I want to make a couple thank yous. I want to first begin by thanking Jennifer Edwards. She is the Executive Director of Literacy Texas. Thank you for the invitation. Next, I want to thank Dale Pillow, uh, the President and CEO of Literacy Texas, and the Chair of the 2015 Conference um, for coordinating my visit. Thank you, thank you very much. And I want to thank Ida, right there, Acuna Garza, the Executive Director of South Texas Literacy Coalition. Uh, Ida and I have known each other for many years, beginning with Abriendo Puertas in the Valley. But first and foremost, I want to thank all of you who are here today at the 2015 Literacy Texas Conference for your dedication. Um, those of you who are staff, volunteers, whose dedication makes the Literacy Texas mission and value of transforming lives through education to achieve 100% literacy through 100% community engagement a possibility for many adults. So give yourself a hand. <clears throat> like you, I devote a large part of my professional life to improve the literacy of adults, their families, and children. Literacy is the right of every Texan and the right of every U.S. citizen in this country. Okay. Many of you may not know each other. I do know that some of you are paid staff, some of you are volunteers with state agencies, federal agencies, libraries, faith-based agencies. It is an honor to be here today to serve you on this important occasion. So a little bit about myself. I am an associate professor at the Univer uh, University of Houston. I am also a licensed psychologist. I study the effects of poverty on children's language development. I grew up really poor in a labor camp in California, so I understood how important literacy was. My parents did. And so I felt that my life should be about service to others, especially where literacy is concerned. So I'm going to begin with something I always begin a presentation with. Okay. In this country, literacy is currency. Those that have literacy get to make decisions. Those that don't have literacy have decisions made for them. That is how important literacy is. As of today, there are over 90 million adults in the U.S. that lack the literacy to lead fully productive and secure lives. So before we begin this presentation, I want to establish a common definition of what literacy means. It is the ability to read, write, and communicate using a symbol system, in this case English, and appropriate tools and technology that meet the goals and demands of individuals and their families and the U.S. society. So I'm going to ask, and I am speaking to the choir here because I know most of you know who I'm talking about. So who are the adults in this country for whom literacy is needed? Many are recent immigrants who lack even basic education in their native language, right? Others are middle-aged or older U.S.-born high school graduates adolescents or adults who dropped out of high school, who now lack the reading, writing, and technology knowledge to keep up with their jobs. Others are adults with disabilities who lack appropriate accommodations in the schools. Some are highly educated immigrants who are very educated in their own language but need to learn to read and write in English in the United States. And the ones that I know very well are college students who are not prepared to be in college. Okay? So you might be wondering, and again, I believe I am speaking to the choir here, 
What are the costs of low literacy in this country? Well, it is lower rates of participation in the labor force. They earn less than those with higher levels of education. They are less likely to read to their children. While I'm on this one, I'm going to tell you a very famous study that informed a lot of my work. In 1995, two famous researchers, Hart and Risley, some of you may be familiar with the study, did a study where they took 20 families on assisted um, subsidies, 20 low-income families, and 20 middle-class families. The only way you could be in this study if you'd had a baby born when you entered the study. They followed these families for five years by observing their interactions in the home. What they found was very striking. By the time a baby was three years old, there was a 30 million word utterance gap between middle class and the lower class families. What that means is that low income mothers spoke 30 million less words to their children. Now I hope that is as striking to you as it is to me. Because what happens, those are the seeds of the adult achievement gaps we begin to see. And finally, the cost of low literacy. Folks who do not have literacy have less access to read and use health information. You know, for many literate, low literacy families, there is no primary care physician. The primary care physician is what? A visit to the emergency room. Right? That is one of the costs of low literacy. So what I'm going to talk to you about today, I, you know, I asked uh, Dale and Jennifer, you know, what would you like folks to walk away with? And they gave me a couple tips, but I thought I want to share something that science has taught me that the government says is evidence-based and that we've known since the 1970s. We know what works in effective instruction. We do. Why it's not used in the schools is a mystery, but we do know. And I'm going to share much of the work in adult basic literacy is pretty scarce. There actually is not a lot of research. So a lot of it comes from the research on K through 12. So I'm going to share some principles with you. But before I share that, I shared earlier you know, uh, uh, how I begin my uh, presentations. Two other ways I begin my presentations. One by saying, illiteracy is a weapon of mass destruction in this country. Illiteracy also is equal opportunity. You can be black, African American, white, Caucasian, Latino, or Hispanic. Illiteracy is equal opportunity. And it has the same effects whether you're whatever ethnic group or population you are through unrealized potential in adults and children. So I'm going to talk to you today about effective literacy instruction. So effective literacy instruction, which you deal, some of you deal with daily, addresses the foundations of literacy. Reading, word knowledge, vocabulary, reading comprehension, writing, and word recognition. Effective literacy instruction for adults combines teaching and extensive practice with a variety of text, tools, and tasks that addresses the learner's needs for education, culture, and literacy goals. As important, which many of you probably see every day, it develops the learner's skills to the point that it's automatic and it transfers from where you're teaching to their daily lives. And most important, and probably most missing from the adult literacy research, is effective and ongoing formative assessment. Formative assessment is different from summative assessment. Summative is, here's a test. This is the grade you get. 
Formative assessment informs instructor instruction. It tells you how to change instruction to meet the needs of the learner. These are the four, the four foundations of effective literacy instruction for adults. So you might be wondering, how can you efficiently and effectively support learners so that they meet the high expectations we set for them? So I'm going to give you a metaphor. You know, many of us at one time or another have joined a gym and like me, probably quit the gym too. Okay, we go with the best aspirations. So I want you to think of yourself, those of you who are staff and volunteers in these agencies, whether you know it's a library or stages, as an exercise machine. And the exerciser is the adult learner. If you look at a Nautilus machine at a gym, like the one in the picture, you'll note, and if you've been on one like me, they are set up to efficiently optimize your exercise quickly. Now, as an instructor, you adjust to each individual's needs, right? Just like the Nautilus machine. We adjust the Nautilus machine, the weight we put on it, we adjust the incline, we adjust the resistance to individualize the, the, the adult learner's experience so that we adult learner is optimally positioned to be successful, just like a Nautilus machine. We position it to help the exerciser be ultimately successful. So, I'm going to share with you five principles of instruction that we know from over 30 years of research at the University of Oregon Social Learning Center and we have known from multiple clinical trials over and over and over that work with K through 12. And we also know it works with adults who need basic literacy skills or literacy skills to better their lives. Much of my own research is premised on these principles. Our research showed that an 18-week intervention, five-day instructional cycles, 20 minutes a day for preschoolers could move language by eight months. These are poor preschoolers, again, whether they're white, Hispanic, or Caucasian, excuse me, African-American, we moved it by eight months, and we're now doing clinical trials in South Texas. But I've learned that these same principles work with adults, okay? The first one, I'm gonna go over each one individually, is conspicuous strategies and in instruction. Mediated scaffolding, strategic integration, judicious review, and prime background knowledge. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about each one. We know from research that the clearer, excuse me, the more robust the communication is of information, the greater the likelihood that information will be retained and acquired by the adult and the child. So, oops, went too far. The first strategy in instruction that I want you to look for in what you're using for instruction is, does it have conspicuous strategies? Are there intentional steps that you as the instructor, the teacher, explicitly teach a concept? So that what you're teaching must be explicit and unambiguous. Now in the American educational system, educators tend not to like the word direct instruction. But our kids need that, especially the young children who come with language and literacy disparities. So now we've changed it, you know, to intentional instruction. Or another way of, I say it in my publications, strategic instruction. We don't use the word direct instruction, okay? So what is it? It's carefully designed and delivered instruction, instructional actions. So let me give you an example. 
When I teach vocabulary to an adult, I teach the word, its definition, but also across multiple contexts and themes so that the individual can generalize this word. The next one is my personal favorite, mediated scaffolding. So the word scaffolding is a little strange, but I'll tell you how to think of it. Have you ever seen a building that's being worked on or a brand new building? It has all these planks and pipes all around it to support it as it's working, right? And there are people around. Those are, skull, those are called scaffolds. Now think of your support that way. That is scaffolding. Okay? So, scaffolding, as you think of instruction, is the personal guidance and support that you, your, the peers or materials provide the learner. They can be seen as temporary supports to assist the learner during initial learning. If it's a big new task, you provide substantial scaffolding so that the learner learns the task, but the key is you gradually fade it away, right? You provide enough help for the adult learner to learn the task, but not so much that they become reliant and dependent on you. That is scaffolding. Strategic integration. This is a big key that often even I as an instructor forget. We learn most when what I'm learning can be associated with what I already know. That is so key to instruction. So you as instructors look for instruction that carefully combines the new information you're teaching with what the learner, adult learner, already knows to produce more and higher order knowledge. We know from research that if you take new information and integrate it with what the adult learner already knows, it'll be, I assure you, understood at a much deeper level. Judicious review. Successful learning for adults, as in children, depends on a review process to reinforce the essential building blocks of the information you gave them. But, here's a caveat, here's a big but. Simple repetition is not enough for the adult learner to learn the information you need them to learn. It needs to be enough, sufficient, for the learner to perform the task without hesitation. It needs to be distributed over time. It needs to be cumulative so that more complex information is layered onto less complex information. And it needs to be varied so that there are wide applications of what is being taught for the learner. This next principle I sort of already talked about, but even I forget it with my learners, my you know, doctoral students, that they bring to the table a lot of knowledge that I have to honor and recognize. And my doctoral students feel as though I have a vested interest in them when they believe that I honor what they bring to the table. What I mean by priming background knowledge, it's a brief reminder or exercise you do with the adult learner requiring them to retrieve, no informa to retrieve known information. So the way I do it, I, we develop a children's shared book reading intervention. And we ask five levels of questions. The research shows Level one questioning with a child and adult learner when you're reading to them is, 
called a labeling question. They're the most, they're the least useful. What is this? Why is it not very useful? Because it's a close-ended question. It does not generate talk, language. To the most complex question, number five, inferencing questions. What do you think is going to happen next? That is a cognitively more complex question and prompts your learner, your reader, to think about what is being taught. There are five levels of questions, okay? And I will share them, that work, with uh, Dale and Jennifer if you want to disseminate that, okay? So where to from here? You know, as, I re as we look at the research in adult basic education and adult literacy, I'm sad to say that there's many places to go from a research perspective, but there are many folks like yourself that we need to listen to and hear what your daily challenges are, what your successes are, so that we know as researchers what works. So I'm going to talk about four directions and then I'll wrap up of where we think it needs to go, the research in this area. First, we need to develop instructional approaches and materials that are coherent, that are logical and have a central message, have a central idea. But it has to connect with the personal interest of your adult learners. It has to connect with the personal interests of your adult learners. Well, here's a biggie. More research is needed on how to motivate your adults to persist. Right? We just need more. We don't know enough about why some drop out and why some stay in adult learning exercises. What are the characteristics that affect persistence. Why do some succeed and others don't? We don't know enough. We need to know more about the work, the family, the age, and the culture that affects persistence among adult learners. We need to identify more and more the use of effective technologies and how these effective technologies differ by different subpopulations of your adult learners. Not all your adult learners are English language learners. Some, like I said earlier, are people that, folks that dropped out of high school for reasons that are probably myriad. Needless to say, the demands of their jobs on reading, writing, and technology are leaving them behind. And lastly, a very large population, more ways to support adult learners of a second language. We need to identify more ways to scaffold their learning. And we need to make a big decision, because research hasn't told us much about this. How much emphasis, how much emphasis should we place on grammatical learning versus language to communicate for specific purposes? We don't know. We really don't know right now. So as you go out and back to your volunteer jobs, your staff jobs, think about the areas we more need more research. I'll tell you why. Our intervention that we developed in early childhood, I didn't come up with it in my head. We knew what worked, but it was working with preschool teachers who told me, Dr. Gonzalez, Jorge, this is not going to work in the preschool classroom. I'm there every day. You're not. You are there with the adult learners. You need to let us know and honor what you know and share the truth, whether it's ugly or good, with us, the researchers, because that's how we're going to make a difference. And remember, education is not filling a pail, but lighting a fire. Thank you.